Hi everyone. We're about to enter our fourth month of life in lockdown. I don't know if those months have gone by uh, quickly or very slowly for you. Uh, in this house, we've tried to take things one day at a time. And when that doesn't feel like it's working, we break down to one hour at a time or some fraction of an hour uh, to keep us going. It's an encouragement that on a Sunday that we can know that we are joining together with others in turning from ourselves and our circumstances to God. And that's what we're going to do as we begin by saying together the words of Psalm 142. With my voice I cry to the Lord. With my voice I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit is faint, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look on my right hand and see. There is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for me. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Save me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Lord Jesus, loving Saviour, few things in life are worse than to be in trouble and to be alone. When life is hard, and life is complicated. Be our companion and our peace. Cover us with your presence until again we find tranquility and joy. Amen. <laughs> and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my love is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can say, all is mine, yet not I. It is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my sight the Saviour he will stay. I labour on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Day, I know he will renew me 
Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat Yet not I Our reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 41. Now let me set the scene and remind you of where we're at in the story. Joseph is in prison. He's in Egypt, far from home, and he's behind bars for a crime that he did not commit. And yet even in prison, we read that the Lord was with Joseph and that Joseph enjoyed God's blessing and found favour with the prison warden and was entrusted with responsibility. And although our reading is Genesis chapter 41, we'll be looking back to Genesis 40 and picking up on incidents and themes introduced during Joseph's time in prison. Genesis 41 verses 1 to 40. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven ears of corn, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears of corn sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven healthy, full ears. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream that same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to, interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dreams, I also saw seven ears of corn, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other ears sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin ears of corn swallowed up the seven good ears. I said this to the magicians, but none could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears of corn are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless ears of corn, scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. This is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be, will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream is given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. 
And now let Pharaoh look for discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harder fist of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come up upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are subject to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Amen. God our Father, in the midst of our fast-changing world, we want to hear from your unchanging word, to know it's true, to know it's for us, and to be ready to respond. Amen. We don't have to look very far to find things about ourselves uh, or our society, the world that we live in, that we wish were different. And sometimes it can feel quite uh, cathartic. Uh, to have one of those conversations where you, you put the world to rights, you take one of the great problems of the day, uh, inequality, systemic racism, climate change, and you thrash out with someone else what ought to be done or what you would do if you had the, the levers of power. And yet when the conversation ends, we simply carry on with life in a world where lots of things are wrong. There is a will to make things different, but we struggle to see uh, a way forward. We're conscious of our own limits. You know, what can we do? And sometimes we know from past failures that we can only get so far. And we're aware of the problem presented by other people with different views and different priorities and structures that seem to present totally impossible, immovable obstacles. Perhaps we wonder that whether the little that we can do or could do towards fixing whatever it is really count for anything. And often in our prayers, if we pray at all, we simply set before God things about ourselves or our circumstances or our world that we wish were different. And we know, at least in theory, we know that we can depend on God, not just for, for small things, but for these big things and that the things that are overwhelming to us don't go beyond God's capacity. Now, sometimes, and I very much include myself in this, our prayers, or perhaps our failure to pray, uh, can betray that we're, we're less than convinced that God, uh, God's will will be done. However many times we say those words in the Lord's Prayer. And in Genesis, and we've seen this, it, it, God makes it clear that it's his will uh, to bless his people. That extraordinary and in lots of ways dysfunctional family going from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then his 12 sons, and among them Joseph, and to bless the world through them. That's what God wants. It seems there's no shortage of obstacles that are flawed people making bad decisions, doing things that are wrong, that make things worse. We see people in miserable circumstances, unfair situations, victims of injustice. But as we think about our reading, I want us to pay attention to the respective roles of Joseph Joseph, who was in prison, to Pharaoh, who was a powerful king, and to God, God who so often seems to be tucked away, off stage, in the background, and how God and Pharaoh and Joseph together are involved in bringing about what God wills. So let's take them in turn, and let's begin with Joseph and what I've called the day of small things. So there's Joseph, he's in prison 
And within all the limitations inherent to prison life, Joseph seems to have thrived. He'd earned trust, responsibility, he found favour, he'd achieved success, yet let's not lose sight of the fact he remained in prison. Joseph was someone who had dreamt as a young man that he would be lifted up and, and honoured, the, the first amongst his family. I don't know what he thought about those dreams as he sat there in prison. Perhaps they haunted or embarrassed him. This was the day of small things. And although he was the, the prison warden's favourite, he was the first only amongst the, the disgraced. However, it's to, to Joseph's credit that even within the, the, the shrunken horizons of a prison, that he doesn't seem to have turned in on himself. There's no evidence of uh, self-pity, of uh, resentment or even resignation. Now, one of the, the challenges for many of us in lockdown, and I'm not suggesting that there is a an equivalence between life in lockdown and life in prison. I think that would be a, a step too far. But one of the challenges of life in lockdown is a certain sort of uh, directionlessness or listlessness can set in, uh, that daily temptation just to, to mope. But in Genesis 40, we see that far from turning in on himself, Joseph was open and attentive to the needs of others and also open and attentive to the activity of God. He was joined in prison by two of Pharaoh's uh, officials, a, a baker uh, and a cupbearer, who were both experiencing their own fall from grace. They'd gone from Pharaoh's palace to this dungeon, and they find themselves assigned under the care of Joseph. And in one extraordinary night, both men uh, have a dream that, that sticks with them, and when they awake, they are uh, dejected uh, and confused. And Joseph, Joseph notices this, this change in them, and he, he cares, he's not ambivalent, he takes an interest, you know, he says, you know, why do you look so sad today? And they respond, we both had dreams, but there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph's response is very revealing. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So he, he makes their concern, their problem, his own business. He, he wants to help, yet he recognises that the help they actually need is not merely his sympathy or his best efforts or the exercise of his abilities. What they really need is something that comes only from God. And yet Joseph has seen how God already can work in and through him, whether as a, a slave in Potiphar's house or now in the prison, how God can work through someone who was so violently hated and rejected by his own family, how God can work in this unfamiliar, uncomfortable and alien situation. Joseph has an assurance that God is with him. And he is totally realistic about his situation and the situation of his fellow prisoners. He knows that apart from God, they can do nothing. Apart from God, he can do nothing. But he knows that with God, something can happen. That with God, all things are possible. So Joseph listens uh, to the dream and he's enabled to give a faithful interpretation and the dreams spell uh, good news for the, the cupbearer. He is going to be liberated uh, from prison in just three days. But bad news for the baker who faces an ugly execution. But are these things not inconsequential for Joseph, for the greater purposes of what God is trying to do. Certainly for Joseph, there is no immediate payoff. Uh, he had hoped that he might have secured an ally outside the prison who might be able to help him. You know, having said to the cupbearer, he would be restored to his position uh, in Pharaoh's palace, a place of power. You know, Joseph makes his appeal, verses 14 and 15. 
But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh. Get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. But the final note of chapter 40 shows the the futility of that appeal. Verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. He was out of the prison, out from under Joseph's care. Joseph is out of sight and out of mind. And the opening verse of chapter 41 emphasises the extent to which uh, the difficult circumstances of life in a prisoner were out of Joseph's hands. Another two years passed before anything changed. So the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph was faithful. He was caring for others. He was attentive to God. And yet for all that, Joseph was still not where he wanted to be. He was in a situation that was utterly unjust. He was let down by his best human hope, his only possible ally from the outside, and left seemingly powerless to affect change. Will God's will be done? Well, from Joseph, we turn to to Pharaoh and what I've called the moment of reckoning. We're cut to a very different scene, away from prison walls and the powerless, to Pharaoh, who was the the sovereign authority uh, in Egypt. Uh, And just in a few paragraphs, we see how simply on a whim, uh, as he uh, instructs it with the words of his mouth, we see how Pharaoh was able to imprison, set free and execute and confer honour and authority, just like that. He wants it and it happens. And where Joseph appeals and waits in vain, Pharaoh just speaks, it happens. You know, the contrasting fates of the baker and the cupbearer illustrate that uh, raw power. But authority over servants and even armies does not equate to a mastery over his own mind and heart. Pharaoh has two dreams that leave him troubled. First dream takes him by the the, the mighty River Nile. This was the, the source of Egypt's wealth and prosperity. Uh, the waters of that river being the very lifeblood of the nation. In the dream, a somewhat grotesque scene unfolds by the side of that river. A seven healthy cows, full of life and health and vigour, are consumed by these ugly, gaunt cows with insatiable appetites. And then he sees uh, what any uh, ruler would love to see, he sees this wholesome crop uh, springing up. And suddenly it's scorched by an unforgiving wind from the east. The crop is ruined and then consumed by these thin, withered ears of corn. It's a picture of sickness unto death. The pair of dreams leave him perplexed. Of course, he has power. There's no shortage of resources. He uh, clicks his fingers and in come all the uh, advisors and experts, but they leave him uh, exactly as he was, without an answer, deeply troubled. And we see that any illusions of power uh, and grandeur uh, fade away. And we just see that common human experience of struggling to find answers to difficult questions. And it's at this moment with a a pang of conscience that the the cupbearer remembers Joseph and tells Pharaoh of this uh, imprisoned young Hebrew. Uh, And I'm not sure any of those uh, ingredients, his youth, his status as a prisoner or as a foreigner would instill any great confidence. But Pharaoh uh, issues his uh, instruction. Joseph is sent for, he's made presentable, and then he's charged with the task of interpreting this dream. Now for Joseph, this must have been a a, a perilous uh, moment. Surely he must have recognised that failure at this point 
would likely cost him his life. And yet success might offer a possibility beyond the walls of the prison. Verses 15 and 16, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So even the, the presence of power and prestige and influence doesn't scramble uh, Joseph's loyalties. He doesn't attempt to manipulate the situation or take advantage. The mindset that says, not I, but God through me. Joseph listens uh, to the strange and ugly dream and he sets out his interpretation. He sets it out plainly, without gloss, without qualification. What is going to happen is quite straightforward. There will be prosperity followed by disaster, plenty followed by years of desperate want. Both dreams have the, the same message and they mutually confirm the settled will of God. The matter has been firmly decided and God will do it soon. Pharaoh's on the cusp of a crisis. This is the moment of reckoning and only decisive action right now can save Egypt, can save him from utter ruin. You see, for all the power that he might have, his command cannot cause the Nile to burst its banks and water the fields. He can't rebuke the scorching wind and send it off in retreat. He has to rely on what God has revealed to him and respond. And having offered this, well, I'd say, overall bad news picture, this dismal prognosis, Joseph ventures to, to suggest a way forward. What's needed is delegation of authority and responsibilities, prudent planning and a careful allocation of uh, resources. There needs to be a plan. It needs to be followed through. And Pharaoh accepts the interpretation. He approves the plan and he then appoints Joseph. Joseph who's young, Joseph who's a foreigner, Joseph who is until very recently a prisoner. And he does this in the presence of all his other officials. Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph's life so far has been a series of downward movements and backward steps, failure, disaster, injustice, and suddenly he is lifted up in this dramatic way, the mother of all promotions, as he's placed in this role with huge responsibility and great honour. It's no longer the day of small things. He's been set apart uh, to take on the great task in the day of reckoning. But I want us now to turn our attention from, from Joseph uh, and from Pharaoh and to think a little bit more about where God is in this story. You see, Pharaoh sees God in the story. He declares that in Joseph there is the Spirit of God. It's a claim that Joseph never makes for himself. But we see plainly that Joseph is being used by God to reveal God's truth. And it's through Joseph, despite his past, his struggles, his limitations, uh, dire circumstances, that God's will is being enacted. So God's at work through the small things, through an individual in a tight spot. God's at work in the big things. Uh, the unwieldy business of economics and crises and disasters. And it's through God that Joseph is in a position to save and bless a whole nation. We see that through God, Joseph has been uh, equipped for the task. It's been a school of hard knocks uh, for sure. Um, 
But Joseph's been faithful in the small things and is now entrusted with so much more. And interestingly, that's a dynamic we see right through the Bible, not least in the teaching and parables of Jesus. See, it becomes apparent here that though the cupbearer could forget Joseph, God never forgot Joseph, nor has God forgotten the promises made to his father Jacob, his grandfather Isaac, or his great-grandfather Abraham. We've seen all the obstacles. God's seen them too. The hateful brothers, uh, that cold-blooded transaction that would sell Joseph uh, into Egypt. The lie, the fabricated story that landed him in prison and the carelessness that kept him there. But despite all these things, God is clearly with Joseph. And in God's grace, God's generosity, Joseph will be part of this uh, will to bless and to take this dysfunctional family and make them into a blessing for all the nations. What about us? Do we believe that God wills to bless us in the midst of all that's going on and to bless others through us? It's very easy to live in, under the illusion. Um, we can find supporting evidence for this, that we're, we're irrelevant or somehow forgotten by God, that our best efforts uh, don't amount to much, that our prayers are too small, uh, pathetic, not worth listening to, far less acting on. We could live in the illusion that uh, if we were put in a position of power, if only we were the ones calling the shots, pulling the levers, that we could somehow put the world to rights. But that's just a dream. But the reality that is revealed here, the reality is what we need, might not be what we uh, want or ask for, but reality is what we need. The reality is that God is God. God is the Lord. And God is true, true to his word and all his promises. We think about our church family. Perhaps you're watching this by yourself or just with two or three others. Even whether you think back to the last time we gathered together in the same place at the same time. How many of us are there in the context of a city like Glasgow? What real capacity do we have to do God's will? We're so easily distracted. Our uh, resources are stretched. Our health and our energy and our enthusiasm go up, down and sideways. We often get the timing wrong. We do things too slowly or not at all. Or we get hasty and rush ahead. But it is God's will and by his grace to use his people uh, to bless others. And he creates an expectation that we will know God's blessing. And that's why we sing a song like, Not I, but Christ through me. Because God has committed to working through all those who are bound up in the family brought together by his son, Jesus Christ. And so when we pray together, uh, our Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We offer that prayer with an expectation that God's will will be done. That he's not removed or disinterested. We might have to be patient. It might take longer or look different from what we initially imagined. But that prayer will be answered. And we have to see that as we say that prayer, part of it is asking and expecting that God's will will be done uh, in our lives, in our little corner, in our situation, with all its obstacles, with all the bits of the circumstances that we wish were different, in the day of small things, and also when and if it comes in the day of reckoning. Not I, but Christ in me. We have to depend on God for all that we need and all that we ask for. And remember that God is God and God is good. Amen.
God our Father, we ask that your will would be done in the whole of our lives. That you might take us as we are, fragile with all our limitations, distractions, preoccupations, with the sense we have within us that things are too difficult or overwhelming. Take us even then and use us for your glory. We ask that your will would be done in our communities and in our city, that the vulnerable would not be overlooked or forgotten, that no one would think themselves worthless, but rather a cherished son or daughter of the Heavenly Father who made them and loves them and gave his son for them. We pray for all that we try to do as a church and for all the work done by our partners, thinking particularly at this time of the Wheel Trust and their work in schools and of the West End street pastors, conscious that they will have to reimagine how they enact their vision. We ask that you would give them wisdom and faithfulness and patience and that through them you would do great things in the name of Jesus. We give thanks for Alan and the work he's been doing amongst children and young people and the creativity that he's shown and his capacity to bring together a team, even at a distance. And we do pray for children and young people growing up in the midst of this pandemic, for all the questions and all the uncertainties and for some difficult situations at home. We ask that you would protect them, that you would make yourself known to them and that as a church we'd know how to bless and to serve them. And for those who are feeling empty right now, hurt by grief, paralysed by worry, we ask that you would bring your healing touch and a fresh sense of your power and presence. We ask this as we join our prayers to the prayers of Christians in every place and in every generation, saying the words Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Say
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.